Whiskey Jason here, whiskey from the viewpoint of American in Germany. Today I'm doing this in English and therefore the whole entire thing will be English. Bourbon Night just went loud live. I think also Scotch Test Dummies went live. And my guest today is... Alexandre Vinti from France. <laughs> yeah, I just came in from Limbourg from the whiskey messa, uh, the, the whiskey fair. I left uh, today about one o'clock, got up here about almost seven. And now I get to talk with someone from Paris. That's very, very interesting. So we have a few people actually watching at the moment. Um, uh, good 12 people are watching. So I have Whiskey Life is there, Norman, I'm sorry, Norm Florian. Um, greetings from Liebel, from the distillery Colmar. I talked finally with the master distiller today. Uh, 321 Sportler is there, um, Tobias is there. Peter, Ronnie, Whiskey Nerd, I always love that um, name. Uh, Seblo is also there. Uh, Mr. To and From Wolfenstein is there. We also have a, a Whiskey Dodo and Bernd is there. I love speaking these names in English instead of German. And also Meat Loaf of 9, 1904 is there. So we have a couple people watching. That's very, very good. Thank you very much um, that you found me on my English speaking channel. I thought we'd do that this time and um, I will explain everything next week. The main reason. Yeah, Gerhard Liebel. Exactly. Uh, that's Whiskey Life just wrote that. Um, I had a I had an in interview with him and one day you'll be able to see this interview online. So enough of the people actually in the chat. Keep on chatting. If you want to do it in English, go ahead. If you want to do it in German, feel free. Alexandre, tell me a little bit about yourself um, and we'll pour the first whiskey. We didn't decide on the order. Do we start first with Japan or do we start first with um, Taiwan? Let's go spring bank at the end, okay? But I think, uh, yeah, logically, you should start with the Taiwan. <laughs> Taiwan, why not? Let's go for Taiwan first, yes. So tell me a little bit about yourself. How did you start with whiskey and a little bit about your CV? So I started, uh, yes, uh, I started to yeah, try some whiskey uh, uh, 15 years ago, yes, for sure. Um, but actually, uh, that was uh, in my student years uh, before I went to live in uh, Eastern Europe, right? because I was doing some uh, political science uh, studies and Slavistic, Slavistica. And uh, actually, that's where I discovered a very good school, but not as uh, many students, which is vodka, especially to discover other grain whiskey. Vodka, you learn where, uh, you really learn very fast, where are the good points? <laughs> because there are so many <laughs> which are complex. not interesting. Oh, the good points quick. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes you have to make it easy. You know, it's like a kindergarten for spirits in a way. <laughs> and uh, so you learn very, very fast and very well, actually, what is a faulty thing, what is nice, what is just bland. And uh, and yes, so that, that was that was actually very interesting, especially in Poland, where they have a, uh, they already had in, at that time a lot of very uh, tasty, savory uh, vodka because it's true that most of the time we focus on the flavor and the spectrum of aroma uh, for vodka is pretty narrow. Uh, but still, you can see the difference between the different dry, wet vodka and so on, spelt uh, vodkas. And uh, yeah, that was a very good way to learn. You learn also about uh, the quality of the texture. Uh, if there are some enhancer for texture or things like that, or sweetener. And also you can feel or not the burn of uh, the alcohol, which is sometimes something you look for. Sometimes you don't look for some, some elements of that. So it's good because then aging is another thing because also in Poland, they have this Starka, they have aged vodka up to 50 years. So wow, I've never had a 15 year old vodka before. Interesting. Yeah, 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 if you go, it's more popular in Russia. They export it mostly to to Russia, but they are, they are, they, it's very rare to find. But you have a uh, this uh, yeah, Starka is the is the main one. It's uh, from the vodka Chamelon, so it's a high uh, a rye spirit that is aged. So it's quite it's quite interesting also uh, to learn. So when I got back, I got much more involved into uh, tasting, um, and then I got back to whiskey. Single uh, malt, I would say. And the main reason um, I invited you was um, you're the author of this book in German, Whiskey Wissen, and this book in English, The Iconic Whiskey. So, and you also worked in Paris, I think, for a very important whiskey. House. Yeah, 
Actually, yeah, I, I, I joined uh, first their testing club and then uh, I started to read their magazine. I became a customer of their a very well-known shop known as Maison du Whisky in Paris. And I started to work for this company in 2006. And after three weeks there, I was already buying casks, single casks. And at that time, we were doing from... 60 to 100 different single cask exclusive to us uh, per year. So working with most of the independent bottler and a lot of distillery uh, like uh, bah, Lafroeg. Everybody knows about the, the Lafroeg maybe from Maison de Whisky uh, 10 or 12 years ago. Uh, we even got offered the exclusive vintage from uh, Macallan Distillery or even Beaumont. Wow, was, you really had some good connections back then. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, Glenn Fiddy, a lot. Enfin, it was no, it was nearly, uh, nearly everybody. And uh, at that time, it was very good because I could try more whiskey that were older than me. <laughs> As, I, I was 23, <laughs> 25 years old. I'm trying whiskeys that are older than me. I just love that. I mean, that just says it all. Yeah, yeah, and when you got like uh, at that time it was around three, three to four thousand different uh, samples uh, every year. When most of them are older than you, you get quite some experience quite fast. <laughs> That's called the fast track of becoming an expert. I yeah. was just today talking with Norman, that's Whiskey Bubla, and he actually had a whiskey from 1938 today, which he said was amazing. Mm. But that is very, very interesting when you have 50 year old whiskeys and from even pre World War II. Wow. Yeah. But I'm just back from Madeira where I had uh, 1875 uh, wine <laughs> to taste. So, <laughs> yes, yes, Alexandre, you beat everyone. That's amazing. <laughs> you win. Congratulations. <laughs> Well, yeah, no, no, it's, it's, it's true that it's for whiskey, it's more difficult to, to, to trace and to have the opportunity to, to have this very, yeah, in between the wars or before the first world war, uh, experience. Uh, that's true, but yeah, um, that's something also to, to try at least once or twice, uh, in your life because things were made very differently at that time. So yes, it's true that uh, whiskey is the same process, but not the same flavors or texture. Uh, uh, you can change maybe every every decade or something like that. They are new. There is, it's, uh, it's a material that is constantly uh, evolving and that's what makes it very, uh, uh, people getting uh, so passionate about it. Yeah. It never stops actually. Hmm. Excellent. So we now have a, or at least I have a Cavalon Solus X bourbon cask with 57.1%. Mm -hmm. um, I assume you've been to Taiwan to Cavalon, correct? Uh, no, uh, no, no, uh, no. I haven't had the opportunity. Oh yet. Yeah, yeah. Even my sister in law is from Taiwan. Uh, our family is originally from Taiwan. So if I go there, I will go for family time first. But yeah, of course, an excursion to the distillery into the north. Uh, would be a great pleasure and compulsory, the, as well as the the the, the state-owned uh, distillery uh, TTL uh, Nantu for the Omar whiskey, which I uh, also appreciate. But now, now Cavalan is a very very fascinating uh, single malt. I remember the first time I tried it was totally blind, and it was at the final uh, of the it was the eighth base single malt that we had uh, at the World Whiskey Awards back in 2010 and uh, I really uh, I really remember very well this whiskey because it was so fruity you had passion fruits vanilla uh, lots of things going on and uh, I say I never tasted something like that I need to know uh, which one uh, it is and uh, that's that's how uh, I got uh, the connection with the distillery and actually well, I left Maison de Whisky one year after that but uh, then uh, after yeah, Maison de Whisky started to import it for, for Europe uh, except Germany because they have, uh, they have a, a company there for their uh, coffee branch I believe uh, okay, yeah. Yeah. and um, that, was a, no, that was a great discovery especially that at that time it was mostly the the bourbon barrel then came all the thing with the fino sherry and so on which is uh, sometimes yeah, very strange because they are so rich in wine <laughs> kind of sweet uh, where we sweet, yeah, exactly so um i'm going to just take out your book real quick and this is the english book that i'm using because we're talking in english 
And we have here, of course, your Cavalon in this up here. This is your Solus, your ex bourbon cask. Um, the, the percentage is different because each cask is cask strength. Now you have WO and you have here the nice little D and you have WO and a four in this wheel. What would that mean? Help us to understand what the, that symbol means for us, first of all. So the simple, uh, if you check like this, um, so uh, very easy, the picture of the bottle itself, the name of the brand or distillery uh, with the country. Here is Taiwan, so it's one of the 25 countries in the book. The name of uh, the, the whiskey itself, so here is Solist Expert and Cask uh, with, the, with some uh, detail on the type of cask and so on if needed uh, and available also because we don't always have uh, the, the, the types of cask uh, that were used, but some, but so we try to display as many as much information as we can on the uh, on the aging process uh the strengths if it's unshield filtered and cast strengths or single cask and so on also is written there you have the six main aromas uh that we found uh, it's me and uh, cyril mald uh, we are doing uh, a lot of tasting together for seven years now so that's quite a lot wow long time and uh, so we display yeah, seven aromas, uh, uh, six aromas, sorry, each time with its picture, because when you have the picture and you have the name and so on, you get it very uh, easily. So in the German version, you have it uh, in German first, and then below you will have also the English, because yeah, it's true that the whiskey world is mostly uh, an English speaking world, like a lot of <laughs> in a lot of it, Scottish. Taiwan, Japan, America, yeah. and so on. <laughs> Even India is English, so. Mm, yeah, it's very useful, as we can see today. <laughs> and then we have this uh, system that uh, we we created. So yes, you have uh, three different uh, areas uh, on the circle for with colors and letters. So uh, it's for uh, the nose, the mouth, and the, and, the, and the finish. So where you will see uh, uh, the main uh, family of aroma. So, for instance, here is Woody, uh, Dulcet, and uh, Woody. Uh, I didn't want to put sweet because it's not supposed to be sweet in whiskey. It could be another split, but here is more Dulcet. Uh, and like this, yeah, you've got like the DNA. Actually, uh, when you've got the six uh, main aromas and characteristic aroma, you've got like the DNA of the whiskey. You don't need sometimes to put too much. Uh, you're, it's very rare to have two whiskey which have more than three or four in common. So six is already enough. And then this uh, shows you that, yeah, if it's woody, the set and so on, if you find other whiskey which have similar color, uh, you can see that you can go across a single malt to blend or bourbon which have similar color or go from uh, Scotland to Taiwan or even uh, New Zealand with the same spectrum of aroma. So that's the thing that it is easy is to see that yes, it's you can cross borders of categories and uh, geographical border very easily. Um, so that that's uh, that's how how it works. Yeah. So we have a wheel of aroma at the beginning of the book. Yeah, I'm going to show the wheel of aroma from my book at the moment. You do see the different things here. Now you can keep on explaining, please, Alexandre. <laughs> Yeah, so we it took one year to design this uh, this wheel. So there, there were already uh, the first uh, there was first a wine aroma wheel in the in the in the seventy three by uh, Noble, uh, and then in in the late seventies the industry the Scottish whiskey industry started to make an aroma wheel, but for industrial purpose. So that's more something that you use to check the quality, to do the quality control and so on. And then uh, this was more or less uh, revamped in the 90s. Uh, and uh, and some people try to uh, to to bring more uh, more aromas to the wheel because, of course, of the of the work of the late uh, Michael Jackson, who did a lot of tasty notes uh, in his book in the 80s. And uh, yeah, they rework on it only in 2001 because there were uh, Things that were missing, things that were big mistakes, like putting uh, marine aromas, so the sea-like breeze and sea breeze and sound aroma in the phenolic content, so it means like the, the smoky content uh, category. So now this this is not linked to that. So you can do uh, you can do. Um, marine uh, aromatic uh, rum or wine or cognac so it has nothing to do with uh, with the pit <laughs> our pit can be only uh, 
a small element or an enhancer of this aroma. That's true, and a natural combination for coastal or island uh, whiskey to use uh, to use peat. But that, so that was two things that needed to be corrected, and uh, and studying a lot of uh, actually scientific papers on whiskey and other uh, age uh, spirit mostly. And uh, yeah, the agro industry uh, categorization, we decided to go for 12 different families of aroma. So yeah. cereal, uh, of course, the grain, the malty, uh, uh, the, some of the yeasty uh, element, uh, dulcet, so like honey-like, honey-like, syrup-like uh, elements, floral, of course, fruits, so dry, fresh, citric, or more sen solventy because yeah, it's just uh, depends also of the concentration. And then we've got the the grassy marine mineral. Uh, yes, uh, if you if we taste carefully, but that's not something that is very often uh, often um, quoted. But the mineral elements are correct. Also interesting uh oily smoky sulfurous element where you can find some good or bad depending on the proportion the whiny and the woody so that's uh, that's how it works and uh, with that we've got this uh, this small circle uh, over there where we can go uh, and and check uh, uh, for the main uh, family of aroma and go across categories and countries as i mentioned before very very good um I'm just going to throw out something. Um, we're talking about books today, and right now I'm reading this book that I just put in the chat. It's called Whiskey Business, How Small Batch Distilleries Are Transforming American Spirits. Mm -hmm. It's by Tom um, Actitelli. Um, it's an excellent, excellent book. I unfortunately only have it as an audio book at the moment, which I'm listening to. It's fantastic. It talks about the, the vodka industry, how it started up in the 60s, 70s, up in the 80s, but Aquavit with a great, great um, goose and all that. And um, then they go over to gin and they go to whiskey and they go to all the different McCarthy's and Maker's Mark. And it's just a fantastic history chronologically more or less about how these micro uh, distilleries started in america and influenced the entire thing and we now have over 1200 different distilleries in the states and it's a really 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 good thing for that all right good so um this book is a very very nice book whiskey Vissen. we will taste a little bit of the whiskey first and then we'll come back to the book if that's okay so what should i i should have wood i have should have a dolce a sweetness and I should have wood on the finish, right? Uh, yeah, they are quite close because the, the the work of the of the master blender there also is to ensure that yeah each cask has its personality, but they are still in the range uh, in terms of quality. We are used to that uh, in the bourbon business, like Blantons and so on, where each time you have a single cask, but each time you have the same quality. So the spectrum of aroma change. Uh, it's true that when we have a series of single casks, what we do actually is that we do like an average yep. of the main aroma on several single casks from that range. And uh, we see that across the years, uh, they tend to have quite similar profile all in all. So it's more a family of single cask uh, tasting note. All right. Very, very good. So I was just looking for that as well here. Um, so the first thing I do get in the nose is I get a sweet bourbon vanilla moment. And it doesn't really smell or doesn't really feel like it's 57.1%. Um, it's really, really um, a very, very, um, a very, very sweet, a very, very mellow, the word I'm trying to look for, for this amount of... Um, of, of, of strength with ABV. So what would you actually, and your expertise here, what notes do you have on the nose? Uh, what I had was, <laughs> yeah, the, the vanilla is definitely there because yes, what they look for is, a, is, a, actually, yes. is a very clear extraction of the quality of the wood. And uh, that's true that the, the wood policy and the wood management at uh, Cavalan Distillery is, uh, absolutely uh, revolutionary so they're really uh, um they took the best uh, scientific knowledge and plastic from uh, scotland i guess they got some help or at least uh, advice from uh, the japanese uh, especially i think uh, some was also um doctor what was his name who also helped um kill, kill Holman? yeah he worked at many this series um he died so, last year unfortunately so, 
Yeah, I got yes. his name just, uh, yeah, 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 he died uh, just last year, yeah. And his, one uh, of his main things was just the distilling process as well as the wood management, which was a very important factor there. Excellent, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. this, uh, this uh, re reworked cask and so on, so to, to, to bring more flavor, but also consistency, and you ca we can see uh, in the range uh, uh, this. And the, the quality of the distillate itself is very important, and uh, uh, the feeling strength and so on to, to extract exactly this aroma from the wood first and then give more development so yeah we can have some kind of uh, uh, passion fruit to sour soap uh, aromas or banana which are uh, developing uh, after a while coconut are quite uh, we're quite used to uh, banana coconut caramel uh, vanilla from uh, from a bourbon cask naturally here it's interesting to to see that uh, Sometimes we say uh, this sour soap element is 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 not always uh, very well known, but uh, you you find it also in Talisker, for instance. Uh, but exactly. then after, uh, with all the peppery and smokiness or the salty uh, elements, it's hard to see exactly the precise fruit that we have uh, in it. But uh, there are some ways to 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 enhance the the, the fruitiness when you do. Uh, a pity whiskey uh, tasting. I, I don't know if you ever done that, but you know that you need 15 minutes. Your nose that, that need 15 minutes to acclimate to uh, to the room you're in. So okay, I wasn't aware that it's 15 minutes, but I would have said maybe five. But yes, I I, I am aware that yeah. it's a moment to acclimate. Yes. Yeah. So the brain actually can filter the information. It's a bit like colors and so on. We can uh, we can change our perception. Well, we are more reactive with colors, but if we concentrate, we can see also like 30, 40 colors very rapidly. Uh, even though culturally we are we only have 11 main, but then we can we can train it. It's a bit the same. So we need 15 minutes. And uh, so what you do is first you start your state tasting with one or several uh, uh, whiskies. I like I like to do it, for instance, with uh, Lafroy, Garbeg, and Talisker. And then after <laughs> Those are three different the, ones, yes. <laughs> yeah, they, they have different profile, and everybody say, yeah, but they are very uh, uh, marine-like and uh, very pity, very pity, very pity all the time. And I say the, the problem is that with the experience, uh, we, we we try also to have the same filter for pitiness. First, we analyze the pitiness, the the intensity, the quality uh, uh, of the pitiness. But then after, we go very fast to the fruitiness of. I love the fruitiness of the Lafroig or or uh, Talisker or Arbeck. So so you do this tasting for half an hour or something like that. And then if you have a small pit cone, you know it's very easy uh, to to find those pit cones. Arbeck was with some. Uh, you had also this uh, a big pit from. Um, uh, Douglas Lane at the time also right. they were doing mm -hmm. some. Uh, you can buy these Highland pit cones and uh, they are very small. They need five to ten minutes to burn, and then they will bring a lot of pit smoke in the room. So by the time it will be uh, it will be over, you will have a big pit smoke uh, aroma. And then when you get back to your whiskey, you can't smell the pit anymore in them. <laughs> That's cool. I might have to Taste do that because I have my problems yeah. with my heatiness sometimes. I I. Uh, Okay, good, good. Who knows what room I'm going to use for that, though? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 not the room where you you store all your bottles. But like that, you can. <laughs> that find was my first. I was like, not here. <laughs> Maybe here. Yeah, no, no, that's not where you smoke your cigars or your pit cones. But that's how you find. Uh, that's how you find uh, the pineapple, uh, the characteristic pineapple uh, with the the reflex system uh, uh, from uh, from. Um, from Arbeg, uh, the same system actually with the, the reflux uh, uh, at Talisker, a little bit different, but it gives more this uh, sour soap uh, taste, uh, which is not exactly apple, not exactly a citrus, but maybe in between to explain it. Uh, and then yes, most of the of the red fruit uh, of the of of the Lafroyd. So yeah, that's a good trick maybe <laughs> to try sometime uh, when you have uh, really uh, pit freaks and so on to see beyond that and and show the interest actually that they, in their DNA they have much more than pit and uh, the race for the most pitiness, the most uh, pity uh, whiskey is very interesting. But we are not only looking for that. Yet. So we're coming to the peat or the, the a little bit later. Let's go back to our Cavalan um, Solista. I'm going to try it. Um, maybe you also have something there. Um, do you often add water? And if so, how much water? 
Um, yeah, first of all, I I, I know the, everything at uh, at the bottling stress uh, strengths for sure. Um, then uh, I try to have uh, to pour uh, to pour the same whiskey in different glass, and uh, also to have it slightly diluted, so around uh, 50 52 percent maybe. Sometimes you just start with one or two drops because they seem close a little, and then when you just add one or few drops, you it really releases. Uh, it's aromas uh, very fast uh, or more they are more easily uh, readable um, but yeah usually yeah around 50. if if you go too much below the thing is that you the dilution effect change all the profile of aroma uh, yes, you do change the profile a lot but sometimes i do like to go way down below 40 maybe even down to 30 percent and just have a little bit more of the nuance there don't you ever do that no, it's 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 something I do. Uh, it's very well, I mean the blenders in Scotland use it very uh, often. It, they dilute to 20, 25 percent, and where we're doing also uh, uh, scientific analysis. I work with universities on that. Uh, for the nose, yeah, we, we usually use a strength of 20 percent uh because uh, a very low uh, very low strength to 20 25 actually is very easy to 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 to, to check for a default <laughs> i didn't know so, that interesting so now all the way down to 20 percent that's very yeah, very 20 25 um, yeah you you can control very easily if something is too much on one side or has some uh, faultiness uh you can do it by the nose and get less tired and so you can go through dozens or hundreds of samples in the morning very very fast <laughs> hundreds of samples in the morning yes 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 which means you really that test them, uh, ex exclusively in the morning <laughs> normally it's mostly or exclusively in the morning that we taste because uh we, the, we are less tired and uh, uh the, the, the the palette is still fresh and the nose is quite fresh it's around 10 11 in the morning which is the best uh but sometimes yeah, yeah when you're working with blender you have to go through maybe i don't know three four hundred samples so you only know them you cannot taste them you, you would be <laughs> too harsh uh, exactly. so, I, I don't know what too much is but three to four hundred samples is way too much <laughs> I remember once I, I entered the room and then I checked the table and uh, actually I didn't realize there were so many tables but already on the table itself there were like uh, yeah 500 and actually there were already uh, six tables like that that were set and I said I can't do that in one day. <laughs> <laughs> I can't one day. do that in one day. That's exactly right. Wow. All right. Very very good. Bobby is in the room and he talked about me being like a printer. Are you referring to my voice that sounds a little bit very, very hoarse? Or what is Bobby referring to? Who knows? <laughs> All right, good. Um, I did put a couple drops in here. I do think, oh, the nose actually opened up. I get more than just the vanilla now. I get a little bit of the wood and a little bit of the honey and a little bit of, I actually get honeysuckle, but it might just be because I smelled it an hour ago with my wife while we were drug, um, taking a nice little, a nice little bike ride here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a little bit of water actually makes it for me personally. Um, that cuts down the alcohol. It puts a little bit more of a more of a fruity character. That bourbon vanilla comes through, but it's not a terribly complex whiskey. No, no. I think the, 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 also the, the the interest of Cavalan is uh, in a way that yeah. The, the, the distillate itself, it's quite simple. It goes into a very active maturation because of the climate. Uh, very high quality wood also. So uh, it's, uh, it's the ethanol that is the extractive element. Uh, so they are not that complex. That's why also many people prefer uh, the, 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 the wine cask because uh, as they have they are not so strong in their main line of aroma, uh, the, the new make, so uh, they, they are more balanced with the influence uh, of the wood. Uh, but I think, you know, as it was good to, 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 to show something like that, because uh, you really see the quality. When you taste a, a bourbon cask uh, Cavalan, you see the quality of the distillation, the raw materials, the cask, the aging, the, the, the bottling and everything. So um, for me, it was, uh, it was uh, eight years ago, that was a, a very big uh, surprise, especially when you know that at that time, the distillery was less than four years old. 
Yeah, that's exactly what is surprising. Was already the top eight. <laughs> it was already in the top eight single malt at the World Whiskey Award. So, wow, mm. impressive, so, uh, very, okay. very good. Mm. So, um, we're going to move on now. This is also something you recommended. I have the, and you can pronounce it better than I can. Um, from Japan, which is it? What is it called? Uh, Miyagi Kyu. So it's between O and U if you want at the end. Uh, it used to be written with the O U at the end, actually, Miyagi Q. Uh, but uh, yes, Miyagi Q are known also as a Sendai distillery. Exactly. So, uh, so we have I have the 2017 yeah. here, Rum Cast Finish. It was part of a actually a gift box together with the Yochi. Um, yes. Also 2017 um, rum cask. I, done, I actually did a video about this. And um, the whiskey, just a short overview, is a nice whiskey, but it's way overpriced. Yeah, oh, I yes, mean, yes, both yes, bottles yes. together run around 800 euros, and that's just way too much. 800 now? Whoa. Yes, and the... 600 in Britain, and they're 800 in Germany. For the two? For both. Well, for both, yeah. Hey. Yeah, that's like 300 something uh, per bottle. Yeah. yeah, no, it's way too much, especially that there is no age statement or nothing. It's just a single malt finish in Nicaraguan, Flor de Caña rum cask, something like that. Right, yeah. A I bit like find that information online. Um, mm -hmm. they, they, um, that was from the um, Luca Gargano. It's from the um, Velia um, um, Canori in Italy, the rum. It was ah, the I, I don't I know where he got the cask, but he's um he selected his rum cask for this. This was and they had a one okay, year so rum. Should be the Caroni, yeah. mm. So that should be the yeah. Caroni, yeah. No, I think no. uh I it's it's a very special whiskey. Personally, I didn't like it at all. Uh, I, I've tasted a lot of Miyagi Kyo. Uh, uh, Miyagi Kyo. Uh, I, I, I remember the first time I went to the distillery. I saw Maison de Whisky is still, uh, but we started in 2006, just three weeks after uh, or one month after I started there, uh, to be the exclusive European uh, importer for uh, for for Nika Whisky, which was doing like. 10 something thousand bottle per year uh, for export. Now it's over something like 3 million or more. <laughs> so yeah, it was the really, really beginning of the exportation uh, of the of those whiskey. And I went to to the Miyagi Kyo distillery, which is definitely a fascinating uh, profile because that that's like the one of the very first uh, very, very Japanese style uh, distillery. Created as very very Japanese, Yoichi is very very uh, Japanese. Uh, Yamazaki was first designed by Masataka Taketsu and two Scottish to to very work. Scottish, in right. Right. Now so, we go to more of the Japanese and yeah, yeah. So when they started the distillery in '69, actually the first uh, totally uh, automated and computerized distillery in the world, as far as I know. Uh, nearly 50 years ago, yeah, they, 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 they wanted to make something that, that was very different. So they already had uh, 30 or 40, no, he had more than 40 years, uh, nearly 50 years of, of experience. So no, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fantastic uh, distillate. They, they also have the very big specificity of the Japanese is that they, they mostly have their in-house uh, cooperage. A bit like uh, Balvenie, Glenn Glenfiddich also has, so that's a very, very big uh, quality, qualitative uh, element. You control, you can experiment more easily, um, and uh, you can, yeah, recharge, uh, refurbish all your cask. Uh, that's that's really a key element. Um, and uh, yes, they were doing a lot of things. And uh, first time I went there, yeah, the the, the distillery manager yeah, pulled me. Uh, some uh, 25 years old uh, cast strengths. Uh, it's a release that was, I think, never commercial. And uh, and then they had a wide, wide, wide uh, array of uh, uh, of cask and uh, level of peat and so on and so on. It just, ooh. Yeah, it's it's you know this complex distillery that's like uh, Loch Lomond is. So in one distillery you can do you so all three many things. Types. You can do the malts, you can do the grains, you can do the blends. Yeah, since '99, actually, they do they do the grain. Yeah, yeah, yeah they, but it's exactly the same distillery. They just uh, they just move it to 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 Sendai. Uh, exactly the same uh, uh, coffee, coffee 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 still uh, brought. Uh, they were designed in '63 at Blair's in Glasgow. 
so very Scottish. There was a question from one of my um, yeah. people in the chat, and you have here from Sarge a preface. Do you know Sarge? How did you get him to write something for your book? Oh, <laughs> I bribed him. No, Eric. <laughs> no, I know Serge. Uh, I know Serge from uh, when I was still an amateur. Actually, <laughs> I was not a professional. Uh, and uh, yeah, then I, I started at, uh, uh, to buy the, 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 some of the cask and stuff like that at Maison de Whisky. So we get to know each other uh, a bit more uh, with other friends. We had a lot of uh, whisky enthusiast friends uh, uh, in Paris and in France. And then more and more in Belgium, in Germany, in Scotland, in England, in Italy and so on. In Japan, at that time, it was a smaller world and we could catch nearly every, everybody at Limbo, for instance. Um, I'm sure the phrase malt maniac means something for you, doesn't it? Malt maniac? Yes. Yeah, I remember. Oh, yeah, yeah, I got many, many awards for the, I mean, we got at uh, Maison de Whiskey a lot of awards for all those bottlings. Uh, I remember one year out of the 50 top, we had 25. Well, congratulations. Wow. Okay. And one of the, the judges, one of the person who actually installed it back then, I had a nice conversation with him um, this morning in Limburg. And I was like, I'm sorry, I don't know who you are. He says, yes, I've been not that active for the last couple of years. I said, I'm sorry, I just started two years ago. So um, we did have a generation it? conflict there. Who was this generation, this old, uh, old uh, generation? <laughs> well, the malt maniacs are a little bit older, yeah? I mean, that's like 10 years ago almost, where they were at their high. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's true, yeah, the malt maniacs, yeah. yeah. But Serge uh, uh, was uh, preeminent. So some of them went professional, so they couldn't do the, the tasting notes, uh, uh, like Luke Timmermans uh, with the Glenn Farclas collector and, uh, and, and, and started. He wanted to do also his single cast, so it was this range uh, that he that he was doing in partnership also with some German company as far as I know. Uh, there was Gerd Bero with the Arbeck collector, then came also but there was Olivier Umbrecht, uh, the, the, the the Island Park collector. The funny thing that I didn't know he was a winemaker at all. For me he was just uh, somebody <laughs> that was very good taster and who we I would always share some Island Park when he was there. <laughs> and then I just sounds good. The, he got the prize for best winemaker in the world at New York just two days ago. Oh, you're, you're making wine, actually. <laughs> no, they, they, but he did uh, some experiment of wine age in, uh, I think it was Brucladic cask, and uh, his cask were used also of wine, um, were used to make um, some some whiskey. No, it's uh, Serge. So Serge, I know him for a long time. Also, I grew up in Alsace, and he, he's, he lives and he's from Alsace. So uh, I've had the opportunity also to go to his house and his uh, and to taste uh, some uh, some whiskey. Actually, doing some distillation also over there, fruit uh, fruit brandy. Uh, and uh, no, no, he's a, he's a very long uh, acquaintance. Uh, I would say even friend but <laughs> for a very long time. Now, my next question is. Why do you write a book? I mean, I have tasting notes and I have things like that, but I've never actually done a book. This says actually in English with a thousand different, um, and in German it's seven hundred and fifty different whiskeys here. That's a lot. Um, how do you? How did you have the idea of doing a book about whiskey? Uh, I did my first book about whiskey in two thousand nine with a big uh, French uh, publishing um, company. Um, I, I, I was I was writing all the the catalog uh, for for Maison du Whisky, so it was for for a professional uh, customer to explain them the difference between the whiskies, the distilleries, uh, the dependent bottlers, but also uh, different countries. Uh, we were yeah we were the first one I mean, to have such a large uh, collection of Japanese, then we had also the the Indian, Australian, New Zealand. You you needed education a lot of education so actually writing things about whiskey and spirit also because i was dealing with other spirit already at that time uh was in my my, my daily business and i think you know we were just uh, intermediary that's the good thing when you're in the in the commerce of of things is that you you know the final consumer how they appreciate it in your market and uh uh, so there are so many different uh, ways to appreciate whiskey, uh, and then uh, you connect. So you're just uh, you're just giving uh, 
uh, I mean, transmitting something, the passion, the knowledge, the specificity of a place, of people, of the of the quality of the spirit, and so on. So writing, writing is very important. At that time, also we had less uh, internet things, blah blah blah. <laughs> and we, yeah, we the start of YouTube, YouTube. Uh, yeah, we did just a little. Uh, we did, we are doing podcast a little. We were we we did a lot of things with technology, but yeah. book is essential because it's knowledge that stays. So you can write maybe more about your uh, appreciation at one precise time and so on. But book is something that stays for years. So it has to be useful for at least five or years or a decade. So those have to be essential elements and it's good to also to yeah to transmit part of that experience uh, in the in the book. Uh, Iconic Whiskey started in 2015 in, in French and other languages, 16 in English and uh, 17 in um, in German. And, and you have um, a, a total of six different languages, and the seventh was Chinese, which is now being worked worked on, which is I think yes, 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 yes. Chinese should be printed uh, very soon. So yeah, we have uh, French, Dutch, Italian, English, uh, German, Russian, and uh, yeah, we we will look to expand it to ten or twelve languages. Uh, I just think that's fantastic that I have the author here of a whiskey book that's been translated into six, maybe even in the future into 12 languages and just mm -hmm. tapping into that knowledge, tapping into that resource that you have there is just fantastic. And the book also has some very, very good information here um, about the, the process of making whiskey. You have your nice little pot stills here. Um, you have your nice little column stills, which hardly anyone talks about. And yet they're used in grain whiskey as well as almost exclusively with bourbon production, unless you're at Woodford Reserve. You have all your different casks here, the different types. I would have loved to have pictures in the right sizes, to be honest. Everything looks the same size, but that's just one of those things. I totally and, agree, and I complained several times to the publisher about that. And all the Germans complained about the title. Um, they, that that tumbler here is just a no-go. Ah, um, yes, yes. In oh, English, yes. it's much better. Um, there's a little bit here abstract, and therefore it doesn't really matter that much. But this really, every, all the good Germans went, no, it has to be Glen Cairn. It has to be this. It must be this. And that's just absolutely no good. Um, but you have no influence whatsoever about that. So you, one thing you have to know is that when you write a book, you write the book, but you have normally you're not in charge of the cover. Uh, I did the cover for the French. Uh, for, we did the cover for the French, Italian, uh, Russian, which is actually like this, which is a big. Which I think um, is much better. This this is the this this is the thing, but then yeah for English as it's mostly sold uh, in the U.S. They wanted to make it more accessible, but the design is nice. It's yeah, the 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 the, the tumbler uh, with ice cube. Uh, I don't even recall uh, drinking whiskey in a tumbler. <laughs> <Before. laughs> well, you're in America, and it's maybe let's say 42 degrees outside in the summer, and you're sitting out there. Yeah. Take a little Booker's and put some ice cube in, and no one's gonna yell at you. But <laughs> yeah. no, no, no. It's it's the thing is that it's it's also you know. Um, when you do that, you, you, there are something you, you dislike. But uh, the first thing with a book uh, is that the book has to co you have to come to a place where the book is uh, or, or something like that, and you have to make the book the most accessible you can. And that's also the thing with the knowledge and everything you write. If you write something for yourself, don't publish a book. Uh, that's, uh, that's, that's too much, but that can happen. Um, no, the thing is that you always write for the other people for or for somebody and uh, you have to make it accessible and actually this book we wanted to make it very accessible like you don't know anything about whiskey we will tell you about the aromas how they come uh, where they come from uh, is it from the, the the distillation fermentation process or is more from the aging and so on so that's why we put also the this information on each uh, uh, product uh, of course yes i insisted on the column uh, on the column thing, I'm, I'm, I've always been quite enthusiastic about the, the single grain whiskey, and I think uh, back in the days I was nearly the only guy who was buying single cask uh, just for his uh, <laughs> for his country or stuff like that of uh, various uh, grain whiskey. We did also Edonism Maximus Castrengs, the first one um, 
uh, of the, very, the the blend of the two very old grain whiskey uh, for France with compass box. Uh, so uh, yeah, I, I love grain whiskey. I love the bourbon. I love Canadian whiskey as well. I'm not just a single malt or a petite single malt, even though I yeah. You most of the time, I love them. Come I love on, them. I think you do. <laughs> But that's the thing make, make things accessible so work with uh, lots of uh, image but uh, very detailed ones and then uh, yes go go even to hard thing like the history of cask why this name why this size originally how it changed and uh, yeah for, for what purpose uh, it's part of the culture you know the, the spirits are uh, cultural drinks cultural uh, goods so you need to to focus uh, uh, on that also and uh, yeah create a relationship also with the reader. I think also one very important element for us was the, the tasting process, also by putting the glass uh, horizontally and not only vertically. Uh, so you're doing like this then, right? Yes, exactly. And then you can you can have actually the different layers. Uh, if you do only vertical tasting, uh, you can mix uh, a lot. So this, this was, um, we have Schnurr. Um, Andre, um, Schnuckler back then used to always, he was a YouTuber, he was always doing this. This is the, uh, and then, and he, this is exactly how he'd always taste, and that was what he loved doing. I'm usually in the vertical, and he was almost always in the horizontal twisting, and, and yeah. very interesting. That helps a lot. It has more surface area to actually contact and, and to, um, uh, let the aromas escape and develop, right? Yeah, also the, the thing about distillation is that you discriminate element with different volatility. So water, ethanol, and all the other aldehyde, este, and so on. So actually what you have in the glass are elements with different volatility also. So when you're putting them horizontally, by they are making, after a few minutes, you have really different layers where you can check uh, some aromas more carefully. Uh, whereas when you are only tasting vertically, you have them always together. So you have to work on your distance from the nose to the glass. To but first, but what you can have is the most volatile, and then the second and the first more, more volatile, and so on. So you at, at the end, if you go into the cask, you have the ten families or twelve families of aroma all together. Whereas when you're vertically. Uh, when you're tasting, sorry, horizontally with your glass uh, horizontal, you can actually have a much more layer. Then we are also using a lot of wine glass actually to have a, a larger diameter. So the, when you have around yeah, six, eight uh, centimeter, you can see a very precise layer. And when I was writing tasting notes, uh, even I remember Willie Tate from Jura was telling me, I don't understand the thing with your tasting notes with the coffee. Everybody else, I, I agree, but coffee, I don't get it. And then I show him this technique, and then he said, and that, that's the, the first time after 45 years at the distillery that I smell the coffee. <laughs> so it works. It works. It really works. Also, okay, I now have the spring, the spring bank um, cast strength yes. here in my um, glass. Here I have the 2017 bottle. I actually took it from the 2016 bottle that I had left over here. And I actually did your nice little trick and I smelled in, on, on vertically, I'm sorry, horizontally. And actually the, the smoke is almost gone, which is very, very interesting because I need that more. Yeah, yeah. If, you go, if you go very horizontal and you go to the bottom of the glass, that's where you will find most of the peat and the peppery element. But if you go to uh, the, you divide, like divide it in three different layers, you will see very easily, you've got the woody, smoky, peppery element uh, at, at the bottom. In the middle, you will you would have more uh, spicy and some fruit. And on the top, you will have more flowers and citrus. So you can really see precise element. Because tasting notes, you know, everybody say tasting notes is something that is relative. Uh, Agree to disagree, but uh, we are from the same human species. <laughs> so uh, we nearly have all the same nose, and it's an incredible nose, the most incredible, perhaps, from the whole uh, creation, uh, because we have a very big uh, hippocampus. So we can analyze what we smell, not only perceive it very precisely, but also anal analyze it and, and make combination, uh, which is not the case for a dog or something like that. They can be trained for one aroma and follow it for kilometers. But ours can see much more complexities. And, um, and yes, we know that we have molecules in the glass 
So we can use uh, gas chromatography or stuff like that to analyze which molecule are there. And then, of course, we have to see the interaction between the different type of vanillin to vanillate or stuff like that to see the quality, the depths, uh, the nuances. Um, then it's true that according to your uh, DNA, you can have some uh, interpretation of molecule that's for sure and that's the the, the big thing also for us is that uh, yes we know that some type of vanillate some people with only smell vanilla in them and some other will have more vegetal vegetal or coconut uh, nose with the same molecule so when we are professional we need to be aware of that uh, we need to know uh, how, uh, how our nose is made, how we use it, and how to teach it to somebody. So if we only smell vanilla and somebody say, oh, but I have coconut, and you say, but you're wrong. No, he's right, actually. But you have to I be aware say, I would never say he's wrong. Like, That's interesting. I don't. <laughs> Yeah, but some, you know, when you train people professionally, they want you to correct them. And it's good to say, no, you're going maybe in the wrong direction. But then we need to understand. There are the same molecules, we have nearly the same nose, but yes, we have to also to know that some molecules are subject to interpretation, but most of them, uh, we can agree on the on the grapefruit peel, we can agree on most of the citrus, uh, on banana, uh, the, 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 the classic vanillin aroma also. Um, so yes, it, it, there is a cultural part about aromas, but there's definitely a truth. Uh, and and uh, it's true that the, the marketing of perfume is so strong that now we only focus on aroma when we are tasting, which is a bit weird. Uh, but well, that's a very good <laughs> exercise. But also, uh, we want to make to create something that is extremely complex and uh, and mysterious. But, uh, I, I work also with no, nose in perfume, uh, and actually yeah, the the. the, the the, the formula you of uh, your background we have a thunderstorm above us and it's just thundering and lightning so uh, don't worry i didn't hear it <laughs> good point um but yeah, yeah we, we we need to to focus on the how we taste and uh, we have very we had actually very similar techniques uh, with the the perfume nose and there are like less than 100 of those in the world so it was pretty interesting to work with uh, at least three or four and uh, to see that we are very different with very similar techniques but then we work in very different ways because they are coming from different elements to do a result where we have a, the result and we need to decompose it and understand it but uh, now uh, I, I, one funny very funny uh, tasting i did was um uh, we did we wanted to recreate uh, some whiskey in perfume but just for the for the pleasure of doing it and uh, and doing it for a whiskey lab in paris and uh, I remember the first tasting we did, with, there was some Kilcoman in it. And they say, yes, but it, there's not, not only peat in this whiskey. We smell also the horse. It's very <laughs> strange. And I say, you, so you can see that there is a real truth because actually, yes, there were stables there with horses. It was also an horsing school, exactly five meters where the whiskey was uh, fermented. So yes, then you know that there are some real, real elements, and not everything is relative when you have such. A <laughs> Very good. Now, um, I actually just did your nice little trick, uh, horizontal. I uh, down at the bottom, you get a little bit of the smokiness, but up at the top, I actually got something which I couldn't immediately identify. And this is always the good thing about help with those tasting notes. It was a type of. It wasn't a cherry. It wasn't a grape, but it was a little bit more sour. And you wrote down black currant. It was like, yeah, exactly, black currant jelly. That's what I had, and it was so great. You have the black currant here. You have the the Roy Bush tea. You have the um, the bitter orange, and you have some also um, some other nice notes that you have in here. And it just really does help. Now, at the end, after you wrote your book. Did you say, oh, whoops, I forgot something? Was there anything you forgot that you kind of wanted to have in there, but you just realized afterwards it would have been good to have, have had that? In the book? Yes. But actually, we're always in the process of uh, improving it. So actually, the German edition is the second uh, edition uh, that, that we wrote. Uh, we are already working on the third. Uh, so yes, we're improving. We have more space also because there is an issue of space. You know, they tell you that the 
the book can be that price, that cost. So it means that we can print on only so many uh, pages. Uh, so it's always our choice, our choice yeah, to make. Also to choose the whiskey. Uh, uh, I hope uh, to bring much more uh, continental European uh, whiskey. Uh, in I the, don't think there were very many German whiskeys, were there in here? No, 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 no. I love, I love the things that uh, Sleers uh, have been to 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 uh, to other distillery uh, as well. Um, it's the same book in seven languages, so the whiskey has to be available in most of those countries. So yes, we focus with the the most uh, exported one. Uh, but also, yes, some which are uh, quite striking in terms of uh, uh, aroma profile. Uh, yes, yes, definitely I would love to have the, let's say, the best 20, 30 uh, uh, German whiskey, uh, the top uh, 15 best uh, Swiss and the 15 best Austrian. Uh, but yeah, we're trying to get more pages for the next edition as well. So otherwise, I will have to cut some parts somewhere. So, so. <laughs> well, some, and there are more and more distilleries also in Scotland uh, and, and in uh, Ireland. So <laughs> exactly, you have 30 new distilleries in Ireland. You have maybe 15 new distilleries popping up now in Scotland. Plus, 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 plus. So why not? In, uh, Three new in distilleries from India hitting the international market as well. And so, yeah. You have to pick and choose. I just put the link in there for the Wiki, Whiskey Wissen book um, in the German version of this. I highly recommend it. Um, if you go to your lo local book dealer, it's basically $29.90. Um, you can buy it by Amazon or you can buy it someplace else. Um, I highly recommend it. Tomic recommends it from Whiskey Gold. Also, Whiskey Bumbler here also recommended it. It's a good book to actually have. And even experts like me, <clears throat> I'm not an expert by far. Actually, it's worth it as well. I learned a lot from this, and that's very good. So at the end of our, it's almost an hour's up, Alexandre. Yeah. We're going to go to the spring bank here, the um, cast strength. So um, you like, I think, um, spring bank, correct? Uh, no, it's totally incorrect. I love spring bank. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, you love spring bank. Yes. Why do you love spring bank? Uh... Perhaps because yeah, that's a very old distillery, uh, another style of uh, of single malt, uh, but perhaps one of the most, if not the most traditional distillery in Scotland, because uh, they are still using the live flame distillation, uh, at least for yeah, for the first distillation. They're using double, triple, part triple distillation, and uh, they have their own malting floors. They have a wide, wide, wide array of uh, of uh, type of cask also uh, and uh, they have something very particular also uh, in the fermentation process uh, and they have a low gravity uh, wash so it means that you have much more influence from the wild yeast uh, so you have also a, a, a higher ratio from aroma to, to is that all produced during fermentation uh, so that's why you need this strange uh, process uh, traditional process of distillation to discriminate more the aroma select the one you want or enhance the one you want or recombine because with live flame you can recombine much more uh, aromas because when you have so many different elements uh, at the very surface of the copper you can go up to up to 600 degrees, I think, something like that, so very high. Uh, whereas when you're only using this uh, coil uh, system, uh, the temperature is much, much lower. So the more energy you're bringing to the wash that is being distilled, uh, the more uh, chemical recombination you can make. So okay, you're exactly. making things yeah, yeah. simpler. Yeah, and that, that happened for economical and not environmental uh, purpose 25 years ago in most of the whiskey distillery. Uh, the most traditional ones like Springbank, they didn't change. Glenfiddich, they didn't change. Glen Farclas, they did the trial. The first three weeks, they, get, they got rid of this system saying, that's no longer like Glen Farclas. It changed a lot. It's around 94 that things change for, because you, you use uh, a third of energy less. So yeah, you've got a very high ratio uh, of, uh, of aroma and, and also you're making more wild yeast. So this terroir elements uh, from the environment is very, very important. Uh, whereas some whiskey uh, are very technical, industrial and 
can be made nearly anywhere because you know that most of the the big Scottish companies uh, have uh, have the subsidiaries or counterparts in many countries, and then they send whiskey. Uh, can be grain, can be different malts, can be high quality, very aromatic malt that they send to India that we know, but also a lot to Venezuela, to Brazil, uh, some to Uruguay, uh, to Japan as well, and so on and so on. So and um, Spain, South Africa also. Uh, so yeah, you've got a lot of this whiskey traveling, so they need to make different types, but Springbank, no, they don't do bulk whiskey like that. It's very rare to find it in blend. It's, uh, no, it's, a, it's a little jewel, I think, and uh, they have their own whiskey school as well. So you can go there and make your own nice whiskey, uh, shower everything, yeah, get your, your back pain as you need, you deserve, if you really love your whiskey. <laughs> so no, it's a really fascinating, uh, fascinating experience. Okay, very, very good. So I'm, as I said, I'm not the best for fan of smokiness, but if I have to drink something, it will probably be, it might be um, the Springbank um, cast strength. Everyone I know that likes it says, this is one of the standards. Also, the value for money is very, very nice. So, um, Salante. Yes, <laughs> Lanchima. Mm. Yeah. Can I drink? You, know, you can. You can. Yes, you can drink it. I was. I slipped in the German there for a second, mm -hmm. but as I say at the end, ah, I get the, a little bit of the campfire smoke. It's not an ashtray. It's a little bit of the peatiness. It's a creamy type of Port Charlotte, similar um, moment, but um, not really mine. So that's the way it is. Now, Alexandre, if someone wants to learn more about rum, what can you recommend there? You mean in terms of books or? Yes, maybe your book that you wrote? Uh, ah, for Rome, no, but well, I, I haven't said it much. <laughs> but yes, now we are doing an iconic uh, Rome book uh, that we are preparing with the same, uh, with the same frames or with six, uh, eight hundred different ROMs uh, that we are finishing uh, during this week. So that's why we are doing a few travel, like the one in Madeira, because uh, no, no, nearly nobody is really talking about the agricultural style from Madeira. We know about the agricultural style from Martinique. So, yeah, maybe you can wait for it. <laughs> yes, you already have a book also called 120 Rums in French. Yeah, in French so and uh, different yeah. languages as well later on. No, this one, no, this one it has only been printed in Chinese so far and uh, apparently won't be released in other languages, unfortunately, because it was extremely successful. It's uh, perhaps the best selling spirit book in France. Wow. Uh, uh, we sold the, uh, yeah, for the ROM book in French, we sold over 30,000 copies. So. Excellent, excellent. But yes, no, no, uh, perhaps wait for it. Also, you know, uh, if you're a whiskey fan, you know Dave Room. He did write a, a very good rum book in 2003, 2004. Uh, so if you want to have the classical knowledge, uh, it's good, this book. But then, yeah, if you need updates and actually what's on the market, because the style evolved and we've got much more countries and much more products, yeah, you will see a lot, a lot of content also in the iconic rum. Yeah. Well, Alexandre, I have to say thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for sharing your knowledge with me. My one takeaway, of course, is now the horizontal <laughs> three zones of my glass. And I think get my 1920 blenders glass is a much bigger opening. Yeah. And you can really get those aromas a lot more, I'm sure. Or as you said, a, a wine glass. So you can really get it there and figure those different things out. And that's just the, you yeah, another, nice just another thing you. if you want. Yeah, also with the, the tasting is when you take the glass, you take it from left to right, just like it would cover at one moment only your left uh, nostril and then only your right, and you go from left to right. And actually, you think that your two nostrils are very different, and they are not. It's just that the flux has, doesn't have the same speed. Uh, because one is more open at the moment and, and the other is, so you will have different perception. So it's very interesting actually to see what you see only with the, your left nostril, then with your right, and then you go from more left to more right, and you will see more nuances. And that's uh, that's another way also to, to discriminate and be more precise in your uh, tasting notes. <laughs> All right, very, very good. So next week I will have as a guest on my going back, hopefully to my German channel. That will be Nikolai and Son. They're the whiskey manufacturer from Airfort. They just opened up last week their new distillery. They have like a um, 
Uh, it's uh, you can actually help them sponsor them at the beginning by buying cast bottles and so on. And we'll have the father son team here in German again talking about their new whiskey manufacturer that they just opened up in Erfurt. Alexandra, thank you once again, and um, I wish you a very, very nice evening. And um, as I said once before, highly recommendable. Thank you very much for this book. I've learned some. I'm going to learn much more through this book and um, good luck for your future. Yeah, danke sehr. Tschüss. Okay. <laughs> danke sehr. Tschüss. That's a great ending. Let's stop there. <laughs>